You know, for a second, I thought you were this other guy. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This is going to be my Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 7 video. Bill Burr was back, so we'll break it all down. There were a whole bunch of Star Wars Easter eggs. And because of the Disney Investor Day announcements, we learned about a bunch of the Star Wars live-action Disney Plus series that they're doing in the next couple of years in the Mandalorian spinoffs. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get everything. Obviously, I will be doing videos for the other spin-off episodes when they do premiere in future years. I'll explain that at the end of the video, too, after we talk about this episode. Probably one of the biggest announcements they made was that Hayden Christensen is coming back as Darth Vader during the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Everybody freaked out about that. Careful for spoilers for everything that's happened on The Mandalorian so far. We'll do top 10 WTF and Easter eggs as we go along. Starting with number 10, the title of the episode is The Believer. It's a reference to both Bill Burr's character and Mando because Bill Burr's Mayfield character spent the entire episode trying to compare them on a philosophical level and say how they're so much alike. See, you're just like me, Mando. When the going gets tough, they both do what they have to to sleep at night, changing their rules because the Mando changed a lot of his core rules as a Mandalorian, a member of the Watch, or Death Watch, so to speak. So I'll address that when we get to that part of the episode, because the armorer is still alive, so you have to wonder what she's going to say to this when she finds out what he did. But you also have Bill Burr's character trying to right some of the wrongs that he did previously as an Imperial sharpshooter during Operation Cinder. You may have noticed that the intro song that they play in the title is just a little bit different from the normal intro song. Just a different version. It sounds really cool. All the music for Mandalorian is great. But the episode was directed by Rick Famuyiwa, who also directed Bill Burr's episode during Season 1. It was Season 1, Episode 6. Number 9, To the Prison Planet. So they go to the New Republic prison planet where Bill Burr's character Mayfield is being held. He's working in the scrapyards, which is basically like the worst possible work they could give him. You probably recognize all kinds of Easter eggs all over the scrap fields here. Most of the stuff they're breaking down here are pieces of old TIE fighters and Imperial ships. But you notice that there's also AT-AT walkers that they've converted in the background acting like giant claw machines picking stuff up and carrying it around. There was also a similarly converted AT-AT walker during Season 2 Episode 3 back on Trask on the Waterworld. It's just a fun way to show you how the New Republic is making use of all this old Imperial tech. Like, okay, we'll just reuse this and turn it into something new that we can use. You also notice that the security droid that's on patrol and starts talking to Mayfield has the New Republic insignia on it. His prisoner number is 34667. That's not a direct reference to any big Star Wars number or anything like that. But Cara Dune shows up using her status as a New Republic officer to transfer him into her custody. As he walks away slowly, you notice there's a Wolfman prisoner as he walks by, breaking down an ATST walker. He's the same type of alien from the Mos Eisley Cantina and A New Hope. Their race is called the Shistavanan. You see the Slave One in the background as they crest the hill, then Boba Fett and Fennec Shand walk out. You notice that Boba Fett has cleaned and polished his armor since the last episode, and Bill Burr starts making a whole bunch of jokes. He did this through the entire episode, pretty much making fun of every single member of their crew. The Mando joke that he makes about Boba Fett, though, is that, oh, I thought that you were this other guy that I used to know, just as he turns to reveal that Mando is walking down the ship. I love the way he reacted to a lot of this, too. He was actually great in the episode. Like, he immediately sours at the thought of Mando needing him for a mission. Like, oh, you know what? I'll just go back to the prison. I would rather hang out with them than hang out with you guys. They need him for all the old Imperial codes and protocols, which is a nice callback to Return of the Jedi, where they use the stolen shuttle Tidarium and the older codes to get past the Imperial blockade and land on Endor. They're basically doing the same thing to get on Moff Gideon's ship so that they can rescue Grogu. They also kind of did the same thing during Rogue One, too, when they were stealing the Death Star plans. There were also some other Rogue One Easter eggs that showed up during this episode, too, because of what they were doing. Number eight, inside the Slave One, we actually get a really good look at how the ship works, how the interior passenger section mostly stays stationary while the ship itself rotates position all over the place. It's a much more sophisticated setup than the toys had previously made it seem in the models. There'll definitely be some new toy versions of this eventually, and some new toy versions of this version of Boba Fett. You also notice he's walking around without his jetpack on. Mostly, I think that's because of where he's sitting in the seat. Like, he wasn't really part of this mission aside from flying the Slave One for support. So it wasn't like he needed his jetpack or his rocket. 
Bill Burr remembers Grogu calling him the little green guy. He didn't manhandle him too badly during season one, episode six. It was the droid that was actually trying to kill him, the droid that showed up during season two, episode two. Mayfield tells them about the secret mining operation on Morak that the Empire has had this whole time and that they're still using the remnant of the Empire at this point. The really special mineral that they're mining there, the one that's so volatile, is a key component in Starship fuel and a lot of other things that they power, like they talk about Operation Cinder. It'd be like having a giant secret oil refinery. Number seven, while they're making their plans of infiltration, you notice that Boba Fett is not wearing his helmet. This is more foreshadowing for Mando taking his helmet off later during the episode and possibly more in future seasons as well. You feel like this season there have been so many Mandalorians walking around without their helmets on that now he's the weird one. Like, no, we don't do this at all. It's just you weird Mandalorians from the Death Watch that do this helmet stuff. Mayfield also explains that it's the Imperial Security Bureau that runs these kind of secret facilities. That's the same branch of the Empire that Moff Gideon came up in before he became a Moff. They're also the branch that runs that secret base on Scarif during Rogue One where they're going to steal the Death Star plans from. They start talking about the security measures, how they take genetic scans to scan for New Republic infiltrators or people that have shown up in New Republic databases so they know who to kill and who to allow in. They all make jokes about why they can't be the ones to go with Cara Dune because they'll be spotted immediately. Boba Fett also jokes that they might recognize his face, quote unquote. That's just a reference to all the work he did for Darth Vader and the Empire during the original trilogy movies. Also funny callback to the Clone Wars and Attack of the Clones because if they were to scan him with his helmet off, he would scan genetically like all the other clones. Like, wait a minute, you're one of the clones. What are the clones doing here? We thought they all died off. They use Juggernaut tanks during the episode. That's actually a big Easter egg for Clone Wars episodes, Revenge of the Sith in the prequel movies, and the original trilogies. Way back when they were developing Empire Strikes Back, Joe Johnston actually developed a special tank that was going to be used during the big assault. Eventually, George Lucas decided not to use that and use the AT-AT walkers instead. But when it came time to make Revenge of the Sith, George Lucas brought the designs back and just beefed them up big time, like they wound up using much bigger versions. And then Dave Filoni also used the same tanks during the Clone Wars series. Mando winds up being the one to go with him, but because he wants to hide his face, they wind up stealing the uniforms off the other Stormtrooper guards. Cara Dune dropping down the hatch, taking them out is another nice Return of the Jedi reference to Chewbacca and the Ewoks taking over the ATST walker. Then number six, Bill Burr just tells all kinds of jokes about how bad the guards smell. It's just a reference to them always stealing Stormtrooper armor, but nobody talks about how much people sweat inside that armor because it probably gets really, really hot. Mando has to trust Cara Dune to keep his Beskar armor safe. It's probably his second most precious item next to Grogu per the end of the episode. He will be back with me soon. We'll get to that in a second too. As they roll in though, Bill Burr just lays into Mando, just joking, trying to get him to talk, talking about his rules, trying to make fun of him a little bit. What would they think on Mandalore? Which is also a nice reminder for the Bo-Katan and Night Owl storyline. They'll come back around eventually. I don't know if they're gonna show up during the finale, but they'll at least show up during season three. They make a couple references to the planet Mandalore during the episode. He starts joking about the technicalities behind the rules of taking his helmet off. Is it that you're not allowed to show your face or take your helmet off? Because those are two completely different things. It's all just foreshadowing for him eventually taking his helmet off later in the episode. The scene of them rolling through the mining town and him looking at the little kids, thinking about his own childhood being a foundling, is just meant to back up the whole philosophical debate that Bill Burr's character Mayfield was bringing up in the episode. The Empire, the New Republic, it's all the same. The Mandalorians, you think about all those people that fought in all those wars that you guys killed, are they any different from what's happening now? Technically, he's not wrong, although at this point in the episode, you still feel like he's kind of a dirtbag. He doesn't really redeem himself till the end of the episode. He even makes references to Alderaan, saying, what does it matter now, those rules, because both of those planets are gone. Like I said, though, Mandalore the planet is not gone. It's actually just being occupied by the new Empire Moff Gideon's forces right now. That'll all come back around in future seasons. Maybe there'll be some kind of reference again during the finale, but there's so many other storylines to wrap up that I feel like they're going to save a lot of this stuff for future seasons in a lot of the spinoff series. Then number five, the big pirate attack. So the other Imperial juggernauts on the comms getting attacked by pirates, they start blowing up. Mando has to take care of them while Bill Burr keeps the juggernaut steady so that they don't blow too. Because not only are the pirates trying to blow them up with thermal detonators, the mineral so volatile, if they don't keep the juggernaut steady and slow enough, it'll blow anyway. Mando gets some good takedowns. He has a pretty good fight scene. It's just meant to keep the tension up. But the other really important thing happening during this is the fact that you notice all the pirates tend to use 
pole arms. Why is this? Well, it's because of that Beskar spear. In hyping up the big fight that Mando is going to have with Moff Gideon during the finale with his Beskar spear in the Darksaber. So just notice how much Mando uses these pole arms. He throws one of them, he starts fighting with one of them. He's actually pretty good, but if you didn't see my video from a couple days ago, Pedro Pascal was the Red Viper Oberyn Martell during Game of Thrones Season 4, and his trademark weapon was a giant spear. They said on Game of Thrones, Oberyn Martell's fighting style was actually Wushu, so I don't know if that's going to be similar on The Mandalorian or if they're going to change up the fighting style a little bit, but you just kind of picture it in your head watching this happen. Then you get the big reveal of the Empire rolling in to save them after they get the rug pulled out from under them, and they play this heroic music. It's meant to be kind of a funny juxtaposition with the other Mandalorians from Season 1, Episode 3 rolling in to rescue him, and Bill Burr also kind of digging into him a little bit, like you never thought that you'd be happy to see stormtroopers. Yay, Empire! Thanks for saving us! They even get a big hero's welcome when they roll in. It's a little bit like them coming in after blowing up the Death Star at the end of A New Hope. Then number four, Mando has to take his helmet off. So the terminal they need is in the officer's mess, but Bill Burr sees one of his former commanders, so Mando goes in, but has to take his helmet off to get the genetic scan to unlock the terminal. He winds up getting the codes, but this is such a huge deal, him taking his helmet off in broad daylight. Now we saw him do it during season one, episode four, but that was with him still upholding his rules, doing it when no one else was looking, because he does have to eat at some point. He does have to drink. In earlier this season, we also saw him kind of tip his helmet up a little bit when they were drinking soup together on the Razor Crest. A lot of you have also asked if Grogu has seen Mando with his helmet off, and I believe that he knows what he looks like. He probably got a little peek when they were drinking soup, but I don't think that he's ever fully taken his helmet off with Grogu around. So technically you could say Grogu has not seen his face. So all of this stuff with Mando taking his helmet off in this episode and kind of putting the rules aside, doing what he has to do so that he can sleep at night because he's trying to rescue Grogu, I think this is all building towards a big reveal of him showing his face to Grogu. We'll see what the armorer has to say about this when she shows up again because she's still alive out there somewhere. You may recognize Valen Hess here. He's being played by Richard Brake. He was Joe Chill during Batman Begins, and he also played the Night King from Game of Thrones Season 4 in the Oathkeeper episode in that post credit scene where they were creating the new White Walker in the Lands of Always Winter. He was also the actor who played the Night King during Game of Thrones Season 5 in the Hard Home episode. The number three, Bill Burr, rushes in to save Mando before he gets found out, but winds up killing his commander anyway in retribution for Operation Cinder. Their designation numbers TK-593 and TK-111 weren't any big references to anything, but when they mentioned Taynab, that's actually a big planet in Star Wars lore. It's shown up during a bunch of different stories. They use it during the Thrawn trilogy. Remember, we have Grand Admiral Thrawn, and they're using a lot of Thrawn trilogy Easter eggs in the Mandalorian series so far. It showed up during Old Republic stories. It showed up during the Great Sith War story. It was mentioned during Return of the Jedi, during Rogue Squadron, and a bunch of the other Legends books. Bill Burr also mentions TPS reports, which is a nice office space reference. But number two is they're toasting to Operation Cinder. If you don't know what that is, it's actually from the Battlefront game, but it's actually a pretty big piece of Star Wars history. Operation Cinder is basically one of the Emperor's contingency plans. If he were to ever die, Operation Cinder is basically a scorched earth policy. If he can't rule the galaxy, then no one else is going to have it. So what they did is they developed this technology with a bunch of arrays that would basically burn planets to the ground after the Emperor was dead. They would only be able to use it one planet at a time, but that's what he's talking about when he says that his entire division, like 10,000 men, wound up dying that day. So it's all just part of Bill Burr's redemption story during the episode, making him seem like less of a dirtbag and more like Mando, which he was trying to tell Mando during the episode. It's just that it took to him killing his commander before he paid that off. He even does Mando a solid and says, here's your helmet back. I won't tell anybody that I saw your face. You also learn a little bit more about Moff Gideon's grand plans for the galaxy. I suppose Grand Admiral Thrawn's plans as well, because technically it seems like they're working together behind the scenes. The commander says that the shipment of mineral that they delivered is actually going to help the new empire create so much havoc in the galaxy, it'll make Operation Cinder seem like small potatoes. And in the chaos, the galaxy will turn to the old empire again for stability. So it's just a way to remind you that there are many different parts to Moff Gideon's plans for the future of the galaxy and bringing the Empire back. It's not just about the Dark Troopers. It's not just about the Outer Rim. One final act of redemption, Bill Burr blows up the mineral that they collected and the others that they had stockpiled so that they won't be able to use this in whatever crazy plan that they had to create havoc, as the commander said.
and as they escape in the Slave 1, Boba Fett takes out the TIE Fighters using the same charges that Jango Fett used during Attack of the Clones when he was being chased by Obi-Wan Kenobi on their way to Geonosis. I love the way that they let Bill Burr go too, like the slow reveal like he's not quite sure what's going on, he doesn't totally trust the situation, like he thinks for a second they might kill him, then just kind of walks off slowly into the distance, like alright, see you guys, smell you later. But then back on Moff Gideon's cruiser, they deliver Mando's message to him, which is a nice twist on the speech that Moff Gideon gave them at the end of season 1. He means more to me than you will ever know. It's just him throwing the gauntlet for this big finale battle that they're going to have, but number one, talking about some of the big reveals in the Mandalorian spinoffs that they announced yesterday. So they confirmed that there's going to be a Star Wars Ahsoka series with Rosario Dawson's character. It's going to be set during the same time period as the Mandalorian. So all that stuff with Grand Admiral Thrawn, the teaser at the end of episode 5, that'll probably be covered on her series. As well as tracking down Ezra Bridger, I also kind of expect Sabine Wren to show up on that series. Maybe Tamara Morrison will also come back as Rex during that show because Rex is also still alive right now. Probably one of the biggest reveals though is that Hayden Christensen is coming back as Darth Vader during Obi-Wan Kenobi series and they said that that's going to be 2022 but the next Star Wars movie to hit theaters is actually going to be directed by Patty Jenkins of all people so I'm actually kind of excited about that. It's going to be Rogue Squadron so I'm assuming it's going to be set during the original trilogy era around Rogue One or something like that. I will do a Star Wars Ahsoka trailer and Obi-Wan Kenobi series trailer with the Rogue One footage and all that stuff later this weekend so as long as you have alerts enabled for my channel you should see all those videos. My next video will be for the Marvel Loki trailer so that should post later today. While you wait for everything click here for my full Mandalorian season 2 episode 6 video and all the other episodes and click here for all my Marvel and Star Wars trailers from Disney Investor Day. Thank you so much for watching everyone stay safe this is the way.